My guest today is Joël Hébert. Joël, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Excited to be on the show and excited to have conversations with like-minded people. I am excited as well. Tell me, I, I know the answer to this question, but what do you do for a living? Sure. So I work for uh, Microsoft and I uh, specialize as being a um, partner solution architect. So what does that mean? It, get, it means I get to work with the partner landscape. So not necessarily with the clients, but the partners working with those clients. And uh, I like to think of myself as like a trusted partner advisor in a certain way. Okay. Awesome. I mean, I have the same job and it's kind of cool mm -hmm. because uh, you're in Ottawa, Canada, and I'm in uh, Chicago, Illinois, in the U.S., and we just became teammates like five mm -hmm. months ago. We, we merged the two countries together. And I'm a hand across right. the water thing. Uh, and I remember when I first met you, I was so excited to explain that I went on a pizza tour in Chicago <laughs> and that I uh, my two favorites were, I think, Peace and Pequod. So anybody going there? Good choices. Two I've good choices to go to. One's very thin, one's very thick. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, what shall we talk about today? So I think today we'll talk about the landscape of API security. So we can, you know, cast a wide net and talk about a variety of topics. Uh, but definitely it's at the forefront in the industry. And the reason I kind of chose that topic is A, you know, I think that I'm somewhat well versed in the area and B, um, APIs are very important because they take care of the transportation of data, right? And if we take a look at where the industry is going with um, AI, everything is SDK and REST based. So your uh, delivery mechanism to your services providing AI or even the services that we have at Microsoft, right? Like the open AI service is a RESTful API service in the end, right? The service you'll probably build on top of that to create, you know, your next, you know, FinTech GPT or something of the sort uh, will be accessible by API. API. So very uh, important to understand what the threat vectors are and the landscape overview. So I thought we would pick that subject for today. Yeah, let's start with what are the attack vectors? What are some common attacks mm -hmm. that people experience through APIs? Yeah, sure. So if you've had an API program for long enough and it's it's big enough, you'll notice that uh, you will be scanned on a daily basis. So the uh, threat uh, attackers don't shy away. They're not going to do this in a non-intermittent fashion. It's going to come continuously. Uh, they're looking for um, what are called IDOR sometimes. So they can, if they do have access to API, trying to get access to objects that probably they shouldn't have access to. Definitely the classics of, uh, you know, in doing injection attacks and things of that sort. But what you'll see is pretty much like three um three different ways of them coming in and attacking if you look at the miter attack framework you'll see right there's the normal reconnaissance there's exploit development and all those things but definitely ddos is at the front here and i do think that um, this landscape has changed quite a bit in the last 10 years like we used to think traditionally that somebody will hit you with a big volumetric attack and just simply take you down uh, but with ddos what you see is it kind of goes up and down and up and down and up and down what they want to do is activate your ddos suppression system and then let it cool off and, and activate itself again and in the meantime they are scanning you with the tools that they have with uh, possibly trying to to run some of the exploits that they've developed um, but basically think of it as, as them doing like a smoke screen, right? So if you're seeing in your logs, uh, you know, smaller DDoSs, you know, 10, 12 gigabits of data, um, in between there, there's some there's some real attacks occurring, uh, but being disguised. And then you're gonna have to search through your logs. So definitely we're seeing like the attack patterns change in the last 10 years. That's definitely one observation. I think that when we look at DDoS as one of the elements, uh, and obviously for those of you who are not super well versed with DDoS, right? You send a lot of traffic and then the, the site just cannot serve anymore, right? Yeah. But sometimes uh, that's not necessarily um, the goal. The goal would be to create that smoke screen. So that, that would be one uh, example there. Uh, yeah. The other for one- the, For those that don't know, mm -hmm. DDoS is the distributed denial of service. Mm -hmm. And a, a second one that we've seen is in the, um, if you take a look at the OWASP top 10, uh, there's a new entry that was added in 2022. And one of the new sort of attack vectors that has come to fruition is something called the unsafe consumption of API. So instead of 
attacking you directly through your supply chain through you know i know you're supposed to check with software composition analysis what packages you're using in your api so let's say that me and you david were building an api and i'm adding all sorts of packages right we're supposed to check those with tools like white source sneak uh, oas dependency check to know if i'm adding any malicious packages that could exfiltrate the data somewhere else right so we build our systems to look inside of our software to look at all those little lego building blocks and understand hey is it safe or not for me to use that package and um, in the end right we force tunnel the traffic back to an appliance to make sure it's okay and everything but this unsafe consumption of api actually means something else it means that the threat actor knows that you're using a certain element inside of your api so you're consuming another api so let's say that you're consuming an address uh, from an api right to do validation and inject it into your software, um, mm -hmm. they will actually go after that API there and inject some kind of injection. Uh, you're utilizing that. They will go and add some addresses or something of the sort. It goes into your system, and then they would exploit that. So that is a new entry that we're seeing in 2022. So you can kind of see the threat actors are moving in different directions, like the traditional way of, you know, adding a, uh, you know, altering a package somewhere, you ingest it in your API, you host it, and then you get you know, quote for quote popped. Uh, now you are ingesting an API in your system. The packages are controlled over there, but that is accepting bad data. It ultimately ends up in your system, right? You have an innate trust because you are paying for that API. You're consuming it, but then the bad data ends up in your system, and then there's an exploit, whether uh, it could be something like a command and conquer or an injection attack or something of this sort. So a couple of different ways of seeing these attacks, right? Whether you, like I talked about the smoke screen or this new um, unsafe consumption of APIs, but two different, uh, two different ways of seeing things um, that have arisen not that long ago. So what I'm hearing is that not only are there lots and lots of attacks and attackers, but their new ones are being invented all the time. That's right. So there's always uh, something quite clever and new ways of, of sort of um, uh, going and exploiting. Um, I think that the best way to kind of be one step ahead is to comprehend the landscape. So um, just give you a quick tidbit just in, in chatting. I really like a couple of different tools out there. One of them is, um, is called Try Hack Me. And I think that that has allowed me to learn how to think like the attacker and you utilize different tools, uh, whether you are you know, using GoBuster to, to, to cycle all the directories, a command and conquer script to to sort of add to the website and and then how to do privilege escalation so when you start understanding how the attacker uh, can pivot uh, whether it's your api or your website you kind of know what to mitigate or what to look for inside of your application but definitely a lot of new techniques have come out and one way to stay ahead is um reading blogs and, and things of the sort. There one that I really like, and I hope that people can take away today is uh, there's a vendor, uh, Crunch42, that does, um, um, it's called, they've actually been integrated in our Defender 4 API, if you're interested mm -hmm. um, in Azure. So they are a partner that we work with, but they have um, uh, something called uh, apisecurity.io. And it's a website you go to, and it will tell you about all of the different um, things that are going on in the industry. So when somebody gets hacked, usually they have an entry for it and they'll tell you how the attacker uh, sort of exploited uh, so that you do not repeat it, right? And, you know, ironically, I have a diploma behind me. It's a history degree. So I always say that <laughs> those who do not know history are bound to repeat it. So um, if you do read that um, apisecurity.io, we can come in. I, I just signed up, so I get it through my email, but I like reading it weekly. Um, okay. And sometimes I'll miss it, right? So I, I'll, I'll, I'll read it when I can, uh, but it tells me, okay, so this, these are the type of exploitations or vulnerabilities that we sometimes will see in a JWT token. So us as developers, so David and I, we both work in digital app innovation. So it means that, you know, when we think about JOTs, uh, we think about, you know, the different client grants in OAuth, we implement them. But if you were to ask it, the, the average developer, um, what are the, 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 you know, the top four CVEs for a, a JWT token, right? On C the, CVE is? It's a vulnerability, right? So okay. what, what are the type of vulnerabilities that exist out there for JWT tokens? Uh, wait, you'd uh, be hard-pressed. Define JWT token as well. 
uh, so the Java web token. So it's okay. just basically the the mode of transport and the way okay. that the item is constructed for us. Okay. Uh, usually utilized in or outside of OAuth, uh, uh, but it has a certain signature in it. You know okay. who the issuer is. You know where it's going with the audience. You know what type of algorithm it has. You know how long it um, it exists for. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm know, the ac acronym police, by the way. Yeah, that's okay. Um, it's it's excellent to say that because if we don't know, then we'll we'll be looking on the internet for this JOT word, and it's J W T for all those out there, and you'll be searching for J O T, and with my French accent, it'll be J O H T, and all sorts of other things. So that that's great. All right. So what, now uh, there's a lot of threats. Being aware of the threats is a big part of uh, defending yourself. But what else can we do to defend ourselves? Are there are there tools that are available that can help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for myself, um, what I like to do is, is concentrate on the DevOps tool chain and the SDLC. And I think it's very important to start augmenting and building a program. So as a software architect, I think it's important to, for you to put all the different phases from, you know, the inception, um, and all that, and then inject tools inside of there. So as an architect, I like when I'm looking at a, a new element that I have to build, whether it's web app, API, or something of the sort, I go to the MITRE attack framework, and I take a look at the attack vectors that I have to basically mitigate against. And um, the MITRE attack framework will show you, for example, for reconnaissance, here's what usually happens. So we want to mitigate against that. So if somebody is going to scan me, I don't want to have any you know, excessive iteration, so I want to block that sort of thing. Uh, the second phase, so that's kind of like what I what I introduce inside of, um, of the ALM process or the SDLC process, but mostly in DevOps, I like to concentrate on four pieces. Um, for us as the software practitioners, I like to do the static code analysis tool. So basically taking the API, opening it up, looking at the code, looking for security issues in it, and that's called SAST, the SAS. So that is definitely one phase that you need to consider. Uh, I like to do one paid offering and one free offering. So when I was an architect previously before Microsoft, I would pay, uh, pay to play, so to say, with one of the big vendors to scan my API, but I'd always have a fallback in case I lost my funding. So um, I always use a tool. So for example, when I did my my package evaluation, I would pay for a white source, the full version, so I get the reporting and everything, but then I'd have a, a free OAS dependency check. So I do think that if you are doing the um, the DevOps, you should have basically four, five things, I would say. Say you want your static code analysis to open the API, look at the code, look for security issues. Then you want the dynamic analysis, which is scanning from the outside, right? Um, so now your API is now hosted, you scan it from the outside, you look for issues and uh, whatnot and, and bring back if there's any vulnerabilities that can be added. Um, the third one I'd say is software composition analysis. And that is, you know, you open up your API, you look at all the packages, and then you want to start curating what is being utilized and what is safe, what is not safe, what type of licenses those packages have to make sure that if you are selling or reselling, you can do so in certain regions. Um, not, not every license, uh, is permissible to use everywhere. Sometimes there are uh, embargoes and things of the sort, uh, but it's good to know um, the inventory of what you've got. The other thing is if a package is hacked or there's a vulnerability or there's an exploit, the uh, the tooling will tell you and then you know you need to redeploy by either backing off from a version or going to the next version or, or something of the sort. The next one um, is the... Um, Definitely the fuzzing aspect is one that kind of gets forgotten. And it's one I've kind of done a little road show. We have um, a tool at Microsoft called Wrestler. And I very much like that one. It is the, one of the first stateful uh, RESTful API fuzzers on the market. So what it can do is it it will fuzz your, your API, but it will infer what's called a consumer producer uh, dependency. So it will look at your, your swagger definition. It's going to ingest it in. It's going to start looking at, you know, A has to call B. And then it, there's a possibility that it calls C, but it kind of infers everything. Um, so it has that statefulness. And it knows that if you start calling D in, in between these calls here, um, if that breaks, we're not going to follow that path. So it has uh, some intelligence built into it. But the fun about this, um, this fuzzer is it has uh, different capabilities to find 
uh, some some resiliency issues in your API. So not only security will find resiliency issues. And my experience is a lot of practitioners in the API space will do you know the software composition analysis, the DAS, the SAS, and will not do the fuzzing aspect. And I've kind of done a little roadshow at uh, some conferences to showcase a tool that came out of MSFT research called Wrestler. And so REST mm -hmm. API fuzzer. So that one is not to be forgotten. It, you know, when you when you scan a site with a SAS tool, you'll see there's different signatures for SQL injection, canicalization, cross-site scripting. We want to find those type of vulnerabilities. With fuzzing, basically, we're hitting boundaries. We're, uni we're using a known bad attack uh, vector insertions that really, what we want to do is, is break the site and get a 500 internal server error, because uh, that mm -hmm. can be used for exploit development. And then we want to surface that and break the site, right? So um, those are the kind of uh, things that we can use. I, I, I mentioned 42 Crunch not long ago. Uh, and if we want to segue, maybe talking about uh, API first design, that's something I'm quite fond of. Yeah, I'd um, love to hear about that because every all the tools mm -hmm. you've talked about so far are kind of after the fact. You know, mm -hmm. I've got an API, I want to see if it's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. What about when we're designing the API itself? What can we do to make it more secure as we're building it? Sure. So um, the tool by Excellent that I like to utilize when doing API first design is uh, Swagger Hub. So I like utilizing Swagger Hub because it has great collaboration. So as a former, you know, like API program uh, manager, I used to, you know, code the APIs, then design them. But um, it's very important for you to design with the users that are intended to use them. And I do find that that tool will allow uh, you to invite other people to come in, add comments, and it has like a, a life cycle cycle as well, so uh, and also integration with uh, source control like DevOps and whatnot. So there is great collaboration in that Swagger Hub tool where you can design that API. And it has integration with our Azure API manager, right? So as you are uh, working on a design, you can send that design over to APIM, and it's going to be in APIM. So then you can do a mock, and you can look at it in the uh, API portal. Um, but the, the fun part is there are tools like, like what we're going to segue to here, the 42 Crunch that has an API audit. There's a free tool that you can use. Obviously, there's a paid rendition. But it can actually take a look at the contract that you're designing and tell you if there's any vulnerability checks. I think uh, today there's about 300 different checks that they do. So even before you have started the development, even before you're hosting the app, you can start doing your uh, security checks on your different endpoints with that tool, the Crunch42, which looks at uh, the contract uh, itself. So you'd upload right that Swagger definition. It the checks and you can start remediating very early so when we talk about shift left we're way 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 to the left right we're in the documentation phase um mm -hmm. but that that's definitely something that is uh very welcome uh when you're doing api first design you want to make sure you've got a design that's collaborative and a lot of eyes on it and in the second piece make sure it's secure run it through at least uh that test there awesome Wow, this is a lot of stuff. This is uh, mm. uh, there's a lot of people that are, are listening to this and they think uh, maybe overwhelmed by the amount of information we're doing. Where where is a good place to get started, or where did you learn about this? Yeah, sure. So I learned a couple of different places. So uh, um, as far as security and thinking, um, like a like a threat actor, a pen tester is try hack me and hack the box are the two sites that I've kind of utilized. Um, the second thing is. Um, uh, Burp Suite has a web academy, and that taught me how to do things like um, blind SQL injection. Uh, I knew the constructs of regular SQL injection, but I didn't really have a lot of experience doing the blind SQL injection. So it can actually um, take you a lot deeper in those concepts, and the deeper you go, the more you will learn, right? Um, I'm not familiar with that term, uh, blind SQL injection? Yeah, so Does usually... Yeah, sure. That's uh, so we can we can discuss this one. So when you're usually doing SQL injection, um, there's two ways that there are two things that can occur. One, you start doing your SQL injection, the site throws an error or gives you some kind of response, and you're actually going to see things come on the screen, and then you can actually react to what's on the screen, right? Like the, so like it, the error message, like might an error have message. The connection string in it. For example. That's right. <laughs> so in modern days. Um, we don't we we don't see that a lot, right? So what you're going to do is is start manipulating 
um, your query that you're sending in that's actually reaching the database and saying, you know, if the first letter of the password is a, a I need you to sort of delay three seconds. And then you'll see the delay for three seconds when it actually hits. Once it starts hitting that, then you can start moving to other tools like SQL Map and away you go. But that SQL, that blind SQL injection is just to kind of simplify it. Is it's kind of like that that type of technique. You're going to play with the response times um, in order to determine if you know that whatever I sent it, it was this, uh, did it actually work or not? Right. Hmm. Um, so that's that's the blind SQL injection. Because I, within the, the the banalities, as we say in French, uh, you know, they say, oh, you're going to do a SQL injection. The site's going to tell you everything you need to know, and you're going to keep on going. Well, in reality, uh, most of the enterprise sites that are out there uh, know how to handle um, uh, elements. and will not echo things back to the screen for you, right? So you have to always worry. Uh, and it is hard. There's a good, there was a good talk like eight years ago. Um, I was at... Uh, a conference, um, I think it was at DEF CON, and it was that blind SQL injection is hard because first you've got the WAF trying to stop you, right? And then you've actually have to succeed at the appliance and then get that response. And it was kind of explaining how difficult it was. So I kind of said, hey, I'd like to learn a little bit more. And then when I went to the uh, Burp Suite Web Academy, um, they have a full module in there taking you from you know a beginner and then um, where you do get to see the responses and then doing blind SQL and it, it can, you kind of keep on going. And if you are a web practitioner and not just an API developer, there's lots of web stuff there. So I think that those two combinations are a great place to start. And um, the next one is just collaborating with like-minded people. I very much like the OWASP. Um, uh, user groups. Um, so mm -hmm. I used to, uh, you know, the pandemic hit, so I stopped going to during that time, but I like going to those kind of events in my city and meeting like-minded people. And um, I've never been super good at the capture the flags, but there's some right. going on right now. There's uh, some, some are like the Christmas, uh, different type of little little capture the flags that you can do. So um, oh, tell, are, describe that. What is a capture the flag? So to capture the flag, basically, they will give you some challenges and you have to kind of complete them. And at the end, you go find a key of some sort. And uh, once you give the key, you've kind of captured the flag or finished the uh, the element. So it can be sometimes they will put different elements of stenography, like you have to analyze an image to get clues on the image. Sometimes you'll have to look at different cryptography and reverse it. And it's uh, it's not you know, sometimes it can be more, it starts off as beginner and keeps on going. And um, sometimes they will tell you you're not allowed using certain tools um, uh, like Metasploit to, in case you, you're going to cheat. Um, but okay. most of the time, yeah, it's kind of like really fun. And and that type of, um, of capture the flag you can do at home, right? And a lot of people have write-ups as well. So if you kind of, you know, are stuck on a step, you can go see the write-ups on different blogs and unstuck yourself and keep on going, not to discourage yourself. And I find that after a few years, you kind of understand like the pattern. It's kind of like doing an escape room. It's kind of like being okay. the security practitioner's escape room. You know, the first time you do an escape room, for me, I was like, oh, wow, like, yeah, there's a lot to this. And after you've done seven or eight of them, you kind of see the patterns yeah, emerging the patterns. and yeah, and then uh, you, you know how to use it. Uh, got it. And in this case, the patterns are thinking like a hacker. Things mm -hmm. that, uh, awesome. Exactly. Is there anything we haven't discussed that you feel is critical that we get out in the short time that we have? Uh, yeah, actually, well, since, since I'm at Microsoft, I think uh, I talked earlier about OWASP, and there is an element in there called uh, improper inventory management. And I thought that was very interesting that that one is in the 2022 OWASP top 10 for API. So improper inventory management, you're not you know, classifying, curating your APIs correctly and everything. So at Microsoft, there's a new tool that's out in preview called the API Center. And it's a complementary piece right to Azure API Management. It allows you to curate your API. So you'll be able to put the name of your APIs, which zones are they in? Is it in dev, QEC, pre, prod? What versions are out there? And all sorts of different elements relating. Hmm. Uh, so that uh, allows you and aids you with your inventory management, right? So a lot of times, some some places you want to do, uh, when I used to be a consultant, we used to go in and, and say, oh, yes, we'll do this BizTalk migration. And so how many APIs, SOA endpoints, and BizTalk orchestrations do you have? And the answer is we don't know. We don't have that wow. classification. So it's very important to have that classification to understand what your landscape looks like, how many apps are you running, what's going on. 
Um, so that is the uh, the new uh, Microsoft API Center that's in preview. So you can see that on MS Learn, and uh, don't see it as a competing product to API Manager. It is a complementary product, and uh, it's made for that inventory management, for the visibility, and the curation of your API. So I just wanted yeah, to put that new tool out there. I can imagine if uh, if you don't know what APIs are out there, they run the risk of having something that you've totally forgotten about, a whole mm -hmm. of your organization that you're no longer patching, you're no longer thinking about, mm -hmm. and yet it's a vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there is a unique feature in the um, for Defender for Cloud. If you sign up for the Defender for API plan, there is a, a plan there that will uh, look at your API traffic and also integrate with API management. But one of the features is exactly what you describe. It says um, this API was not utilized in 30 days. So if you do have an API wow. in production, not been utilized in 30 days, uh, chances are it's kind of stale and has been forgotten, right? right. Um, how old are those packages on that API? Um, is it being forgotten? Um, you need to put the eyes on the prize, as they say, and and oversee that API. 100% I agree with you. Excellent. Joel, this has been really educational. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. La technologie, les amis, technology and friends, it's been a great time. Thank you, and I'd like to come back. Cheers. Merci beaucoup.